Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars Acolyte Episode 7 video. There are a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references. They gave us the other side, the Jedi side flashback from Episode 3. And it mostly confirms a lot of what I think everybody assumed. We got a little more context about who to blame specifically in different cases as things spiraled out of control. But I'll go ahead and say it. I don't think we actually needed to burn an entire episode on this side of the flashback. You could have just explained a couple more things with a conversation or two and just move the plot forward in present day. We did get a couple more info dumps, some more force lore, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. The actual episode title was Choice, a reference to Osha's choice to join the Jedi, as Mother Anasea told Soul after he killed her, R.I.P. Joke's on you, Soul, because she chose to go with you. That was basically her telling him that he totally effed up, like, no, she was going to choose you and I was going to let her go. Big fat oops on Soul's part. There were a couple key moments during this episode where it definitely seemed like it was entirely his fault the way things went down, even though Torben really took a left turn during the episode. We will talk about him in a second. But they actually started the episode with a recap to remind you of the flashback that we got in episode 3, mostly from the twins' perspective. Episode 7, like I said, was mostly meant to be the same flashback from the Jedi's perspective, mostly just to explain what they were doing on the planet and what really happened during the actual fight, like why the Force Coven actually died. The way the showrunner talked about it, interestingly enough, though, is that she said that this episode wasn't supposed to lay blame on any one specific group, but I think that's wrong. I think you can actually point to like one or two, maybe three people during the episode and blame it all on them. Like if they hadn't acted in a specific way, this would have not happened. Primarily Soul in Torben, which is kind of funny because after episode three, most people actually thought Indara came off as one of the shadier members of the Jedi. Like maybe she's behind a lot of this. When in fact, for like 95% of the episode, she was the most sensible one. It really wasn't until like the very last moment when she's like, you know what? Why don't we just lie to the Jedi Council that she winds up becoming complicit in the events that unfold in present day. The actual opening scene starts on Brendog 16 years ago. The camera passes over this interesting looking Stonehenge looking formation on the planet's surface. I thought it was going to be significant to the episode or the plot, but turns out it really wasn't other than the fact that they explained that there's a virgins in the force. So maybe that structure was tied to the virgins in the force and used by the ancient culture that lived on the planet. One of the key reminders in the episode, and they also clarify this with a couple of details later when they're talking about the actual fortress itself, the Force Coven of Witches just came to the planet recently, like very recently. So they didn't really build anything that you see on the planet. We see the Jedi on a typical survey mission, just taking a lot of flora and fauna samples because they're looking for a virgins. The way that Indara explains it is that 100 years ago, there was a hyperspace accident wiping out all life on the planet, and it should have taken eons for life to come back in this way or not at all. So the fact that in under 100 years, there's been so much life means that something special is happening here. There might be a virgins, like a very strong point in the force which is meant to be a reference back to the Phantom Menace when Qui-Gon Jinn was telling the Jedi Council about the same thing Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think I might have encountered a virgin in the Force, and that was Anakin Skywalker. I've encountered a virgin in the Force. A virgin, you say? We are looking for a virgin. A concentration of Force energy centered around a location. I don't think they're trying to say that the twins are also a virgins in the Force in the same way that Anakin Skywalker is, because the virgins in the Force a hundred years ago is what would have caused the life to spring back up on this planet so quickly. So the virgins of the Force was already there. I think the idea is that Mother Anasea probably used that virgins in the Force, like tapped into it somehow, to create the twins. We'll also get into that during the video too, because that's one of the few, I think, really interesting parts of the episode is the lore dumps and getting into some of the Force Witch's abilities. One of the disappointments of the episode is that like most of the stuff they reveal is stuff that we'd already figured out. Indara's joke about not insulting a Wookiee's cooking is a callback to Han Solo saying something similar upsetting Chewbacca during their game of Dujaric. I'm not hungry. It's unwise to insult a Wookiee's cooking. I don't have it. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. But sir, nobody worries about upsetting a droid. It's because a droid don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when they lose. They explain they've been on the planet for the past seven weeks looking for that potential virgins. They start to set up the idea that Torben really wants to go back to Coruscant, back to the Jedi Temple. This is key for his character turn later in the episode, which I still think is way off, but like way too crazy the way they play it. 
Notice how Sol and Indara argue about how to best teach Padawans. She claims that he's unbalanced. It's more references to him being a much more emotional type of Jedi, unbalanced in his emotions. He's meant to feel more like the kind of Jedi that Qui-Gon Jinn was instead of the more traditional Jedi who are free of any emotion. But throughout this episode, Sol gets very emotional, very angry, and very upset. There's also a lot of them giving in to fear, which reminds you of Yoda's quote about the dark side, the path to the dark side. We get to see a couple new Jedi speeder bikes. I don't remember seeing these in any of the canon TV shows or movies or even the books before too. Sol winds up finding that special tree from episode 3 and seeing the twins using the force together. So he follows them, sees Mother Coral, and then learns that this, this larger dark side coven of force witches. He follows them back to their fortress and witnesses part of Mother Anasea's lesson in the force explaining their whole philosophy of the force and how it's different from the Jedi. Freaking him out because it sounds totally different from anything that he learned in the Jedi Academy. When he goes back and tells everyone what he witnessed, notice Torben's first thought is that these are Night Sisters, which is what a lot of people assume when they first introduce the concept in the trailers. Indara correctly states that they can't be Night Sisters because they're not on this planet. The Jedi track them pretty carefully so they know where all the Night Sisters happen to be at the moment. There's still many Night Sisters on Dathomir during this period when the show is happening. But like Indara says, Night Sisters don't typically train younglings the age of the twins. Typically, Night Sisters are a little bit older when they become official parts of their covens. Sol explains the Force Coven were treating the girls more like full members as opposed to normal children. They get into this a little bit later when Mei explains what her mother told them about leading the coven someday, but having no real idea what that actually means. The whole ascension ceremony that's happening makes it seem like the two little girls are going to be treated like full members like you would treat a normal adult. It'd be kind of like skipping over the Padawan stage of being a Jedi, going from being a Jedi recruit, like a very young kid, to being a full Jedi overnight. And Dara notes how weird this is, like, yes, this is weird, but we need to call the Jedi Council, let's not interfere, being as sensible as you would expect the Jedi to be. You see Sol continually being frustrated with a Jedi bureaucracy, like, we don't have time to wait, we don't have time for meetings, this meeting could have been an email, just like we saw in present day. No time for meetings, we have to go save Osha. They clock the twin moons in the sky, they're meant to be the same ones that you see in the opening title sequence, also getting into the metaphors of force dyads, the way that Mei and Osha are like the same being in two different bodies, which they also kind of get into during the episode, but also the idea of the red and the blue metaphors for dark side and light side together. Then if we're going to lay blame on any one group for what winds up going down during the episode, this is where it starts to be kind of Soul's fault because he forces, forces Indara and the others to investigate the twins with him. The whole point here is that Indara really didn't want to have anything to do with it. Even the Jedi Council later states that they don't want anything to do with the twins. Like, just leave them with the Force Witches and take off. Like, do not bother them. They explain what slicing the platform means in the earlier episode. The fortress that the Force Witches have been living in is an old mining site, aka a mining platform, and slicing is the Star Wars word for hacking, so they have Kelnaka hack into the mining platform. This also explains that super deep dark hole that the Force Coven was looking at before their ascension ceremony. It was part of the mining facility. We get another moment of Indara wanting to be very sensible, like, let me go in alone, they'll treat us like a threat if we all go in together with our lightsabers blazing. And again, it's the younger Jedi like Sol, Torben, that will not let her go in alone. They also clarify there's over 50 people in this Force Coven. Most of the scenes that we see later in the episode seem way less than the number of 50, so like we're not seeing all of them all together all at the same time. And then we basically get the events of episode 3, this whole meeting, but from the Jedi's perspective, and they seem pretty sensible during this part of the episode. Anasea starts messing with Torben's mind using her powers. She reads his mind, learning that he's the son of poor people from the planet Bonadon. It's a planet in the corporate sector at the end of the Hydean Way, which is like this giant hyperspace lane that goes through the entire galaxy. It's featured in the Dark Empire comic book from Legends. There's been a lot of Legends stuff that they pulled in for Easter eggs in this episode, particularly from Knights of the Old Republic, too. When she says that he's traveled so far only to be trapped on this planet, that's meant to be a reference to the way people existed on the planet that he originally came from. It's part of the corporate sector, it got strip mined, so you're either like a really rich person or you're an indentured servitude working for one of those rich people there. So the idea is that his family, who were paupers, were probably trapped on that planet. So the joke here is that he escaped that prison only to wind up in another prison on this other side of the galaxy. She messes with him more, revealing his suppressed emotions and desires, like all the things the Jedi have told him to forget about. 
she's essentially trying to goad him into creating a reason for them to have to leave. Like, just tell me you want to go home to Coruscant and we'll make it happen by causing you to do something really weird. I think the idea here is that because he's a Padawan, he's very weak-willed. He gives in to her request. I don't know why he's crying here. Like, why does he want to go back to Coruscant so badly? This is one of the more confusing parts of the episode that I felt like was kind of weak. I think what they're trying to say is that Anaseya messed with his mind so badly, it traumatized him so badly, that that's why he wants to go back, why he goes so crazy later in the episode. Like, we have to find this reason that will allow the Jedi Council to let us come home. There are a couple lines of dialogue, though, during this moment that we didn't get during Episode 3, like Osha saying, I want to show the Jedi what you showed me. Back on the ship, it seems like Torben explained to Indara what Anaseya did inside his mind. She seems very disappointed in him throughout the entire episode. In the way they played it from here on out, if you didn't think that Sol was largely responsible for them pushing up on the Force Witches and trying to get Osha to leave, he really, really doubles down on that here, and this is where it really starts to be his fault. He insists that Osha is meant to be his Padawan, they have to say, they have to test her, Indara is the one who wants nothing to do with it, Kelnaka, Torben also seem like they want to take off too. She reminds him that Osha is already too old to train, more Anakin Skywalker callbacks, too old to start the training. He is too old. Yes, to begin the training. She also has a much more sensible reading of the ceremony, saying that ceremonial markings like the one on May's head, even though it was imbued with the dark side of the Force, are normal in fringe cultures around the galaxy. Anne reminds Sol for a second time not to confuse someone else's feelings and wants with his own. The next day when they're testing the girls, you can see Torben meditating his PTSD, trying to get rid of it, but you can still kind of hear Anaseya's voice inside his head, like her presence is still inside his head. He tests May's midichlorian count, we see May's version of the Jedi test, she fails just like she said that she would, and then they ask her about the ascension ceremony. We get a couple of troubling details from her too, like this sounds kind of sus, even though as a young child she doesn't think that it's abnormal. She explains how the markings on their foreheads mean that they're supposed to lead the coven eventually, but they haven't taught them what that entails yet because her mother isn't even that old anyway. Then we get this very ominous sounding prophecy which she was given by her mother, Anaseya, about sacrificing everyone to fulfill their destiny, which sounds really, really bad. And now it sounds like a metaphor for the entire coven of force which is dying in order for Mei and Osha to fulfill their destiny in the Jedi that she killed in present day. Like all of those deaths were part of the prophecy that Anaseya gave to Mei and Osha. Then we see Osha's version of the test which goes down like we already saw in episode 3. Indara seems disappointed that Osha passed the test. She still wants nothing to do with the twins and knows it's only going to end badly. Sol starts to seem like he's having a low-grade panic attack, more of him being very un-Jedi-like. Giving in to your emotions, quick way to the dark side of the Force. Predictably, the Jedi Council, we're talking about the High Council here too, so like Yoda and the other people that are ruling over the entire Jedi Order, don't want anything to do with the twins. They say to leave them here, do not separate them from the Force Witches Coven. Then we get Sol and Torben freaking out about the fate of the girls. So when I said a lot of the blame in the episode, you could probably pin mostly on Torben and Sol. This is really where it goes over the edge. Indara has to remind him not to alter Osha's destiny because he's formed an emotional attachment to her. Big, big no-no for the Jedi forming emotional attachments. He also starts to get angry, giving into anger. Like I said, all references back to the times that people have mentioned the path to the dark side begins with fear like this. Then they learn both the girls have super high midichlorian counts. I think we all assumed that from the first couple of episodes, but their symbionts, which are like their signature in the force itself, are identical when even normal biological twins who are identical should have different looking symbionts. Make it seem like the twins are literally one person split into two different bodies, which they also explain later in the episode too. Earlier this season, May said that they were one person split into two bodies, but it's actually a literal thing. So even though there's still a couple unanswered questions as to how that all went down, it sounds like the twins were conceived normally, but then Mother Anasea used the virgins in the Force to split them into two different people, two different bodies. But it's not totally clear why she would have done that. Like, that's the other unanswered question. Hopefully, we will get that answer in the finale next week. The way that Indara talks about it, she says one consciousness split into two bodies. Then this is where Torben really goes off the deep end. This is the part that really took me out of the episode. Like, why does he freak out so bad? Like, why does he want to go back to Coruscant so much? It seems like he wants to kidnap one of the girls so that the Jedi Council will let them come back if they've discovered the Force Virgins. 
Like I said earlier, this might just be Anaseya making him freak out, like her presence in his mind caused him so much PTSD, that's why he wants to go back so badly. Sol goes after Torben, who's gone completely crazy pants. We get a bunch of the same scenes of Mother Anaseya talking to the Force Coven about letting Osha go with the Jedi, which mostly confirm a lot of our theories about her stance during Episode 3, like she was planning to let Osha go, it was the rest of the Coven that would not let Osha go. Mother Coral seems like she wants to kill all the Jedi, she's training Maid to attack them, and tells her to stop Osha from leaving, basically telling her to lock Osha in her room. When she tells her to get mad, that's because she's teaching her how to use the dark side of the Force. May breaks the exit. I thought this was going to be the reason why the Force Coven died. Like, if she broke the exit, then they wouldn't be able to escape. But the way it goes down, the episode is a little bit different. Like, they were passed out when the fire was happening. But, to be fair, the fire was still May's fault. So technically, May did kill the Force Coven. We see May burning Osha's Force Journal again with the little Jedi symbol on it. She seems like she starts the fire without anyone messing with her mind. There were a lot of theories about this after episode 3, like maybe there was another Darksider there messing with her mind making her start that fire, but the way things go down here, they make it seem like the fire itself was an accident on her part. Like she did want to steal the journal, but the journal accidentally caught on fire because she was just using that light as a lamp, and the lamp started to burn the book, she threw the book because it was hot. Then it started an electrical fire which spread to the rest of the mining facility. So the clarification here is that May did start the fire, which ultimately did wind up killing the Force Coven, but a couple things happened before that, so it's not entirely May's fault, but mostly May's fault. We get a scene with Anaseya, who seems like she realizes Mother Coral's gonna try and kill the Jedi no matter what, even though she's ready to let Osha go, and there's nothing that Anaseya can do to stop her from doing that. Torben and Sol enter the courtyard, asking them how the twins were created. The important thing here is that Anaseya does not answer his question, but I explained earlier, based on the different bits of information we get in the episode, I think we have enough clues to explain what's going on there. When she tells him, someday the Jedi's noble intentions will wind up destroying the entire Jedi all over the galaxy, that's essentially Order 66 she's talking about, the rise of the Sith, the resurgence of the dark side. I think this is the show trying to say that the Jedi being so overbearing like this rigid about how the Force is used, who gets to use it, who's supposed to join the Jedi Order, leads to the backlash in the Force itself creating Anakin Skywalker to bring balance back to the Force in the galaxy. The problem with that is that he balances his back to the dark side because the light side has grown too powerful. R.I.P. all those Jedi. So Anasei is essentially telling Sol that doing things like this around the galaxy is eventually going to bite you Jedi in the ass, which it did in the form of Order 66. May then runs out crying for help because she's asking for help with the fire, but Sol confuses her for Osha because he doesn't see the mark on her forehead yet, thinking she's asking for the Jedi's help. Mother Coral knows that it's May though. She thinks that she's calling for help to save them from the Jedi, who then moves to attack them. Torben then counters igniting his yellow lightsaber, and Mother Anasea tries to stop everybody from killing by hitting a giant force pause button on everything, like let's just chill out for a second. But because it looks like a dark side ability, and she turns into black smoke, it seems like it's really sus, Sol assumes she's wielding some dark side magic intending to hurt who he thinks is still Osha because she starts to turn into black smoke force energy too. So he kills Anasea, thinking that she was killing Osha when it's really May, and she wasn't doing that to begin with anyway. R.I.P. Mother Anasea. In reality, the reason May was also turning into black smoke, we find out later because when the Force Coven uses this ability, like basically puts the pause button on everything, entering everyone's mind space, they all turn into black smoke, combining their power. So because of the Ascension Ceremony, May got the mark and became a part of the Coven means that she was part of this ability when they all started to combine and turn into Black Smoke together. She then tells Sol, like I said earlier, he effed up big time, she was gonna let Osha go. Shouldn't have killed me, shouldn't have killed me, I was actually trying to help here. May runs the rest of the Coven, starts fighting Sol and Torben, who seems like he's so grief-stricken that he refuses to fight Mother Coral. We see the mining structure blowing up all over the place because of that electrical fire that May accidentally caused. Then the Force Witches all turn into that black smoke force energy entering Kelnaka's mind, causing him to attack the Jedi. And we finally get the Wookiee Jedi lightsaber fight that we were promised earlier this season. It's actually a pretty solid fight the way it goes down. This explains how Torben gets his face all messed up. We get to see some really solid skills from Soul as well too. Hopefully we'll also see some cool fight scenes from him in the finale. Then they explain how the Force Witches actually died. So Indara frees Kelnaka from the Force Witches' influence, which causes them to pass out. But here's the thing, they passed out while the entire mining structure is in the middle of exploding, so they can't escape, even if they wanted to. 
This is why I say technically it is May's fault that they died. Like she did cause the fire, the fire did kill them, but it was because they were passed out because of what the Jedi were doing there. So you could bend over backwards saying that the Jedi did not kill the Force Coven of Witches, except for Soul, who did kill Anasea. Then we see Soul being unable to hold both parts of the bridge up with the twins and has to sacrifice Mei in order to be able to save Osha. Like he's either save one or lose both of them. On their way back to Coruscant in hyperspace, Soul seems like he's totally traumatized, very un-Jedi-like of him, giving into his emotions again. But it's here that Indara says that they're going to lie to the Jedi Council about what really happened, pinning all the deaths on Mei, who she also assumes is dead. To his credit, Sol wanted to throw himself at the mercy of the Jedi Council like he wanted to tell the truth, but Indara stops him because she wants to save Osha, claiming that Osha's only dream now that is left because she lost her family is wanting to join the Jedi Order, and even before this, the Jedi Council had denied her entry, so if Sol were to be kicked out of the Jedi Order, if he were censured by the Jedi, that he wouldn't be there to speak up for Osha and the Jedi would definitely not take her. So Indara is trying to protect Soul so that he won't get kicked out and he'll be able to bring Osha into the Jedi Order. So as they're leaving the planet, if we're really laying blame here, I think the most amount of blame that you can lay would be technically on Torben and Soul, probably. There were a couple people that did a couple shady things throughout the episode, but mostly the two of them. Osha then wakes up and Soul tells her the lie version of events as they go to credits. The way he tells her too is also more of a lie of omission, like he doesn't tell her the whole truth. Your sister May started a fire, everyone died. Technically that is true, but there's a lot of stuff that he left out in the middle there. One of the other big questions that they do not answer though, very big question, is how did May survive? And how did she wind up meeting up with Chimere? My assumption right now is that she just fell on some sort of rock outcropping and didn't go into like a deep dark chasm, so she survived that way and was able to crawl out the rest of the way. Next week we have episode 8 is going to be the finale. They'll be picking up with May and Soul in present day. Him telling May the whole truth. Probably going to be a pretty quick conversation like, oh, this is the rest of what actually happened. Like I said, I don't think we needed an entirety of episode 7 for just a flashback. We could have just had that scene of Soul telling May the rest of what happened and that would have been good enough. They're still on their way to that mystery Sith planet to try and rescue Osha, who seems like she's already fallen to the dark side a bit putting on that Cortosis helmet. And if she wasn't on the fence before, don't you think that learning that Soul is the person who killed her mother will push Osha the rest of the way to the dark side? The other big question that I'm hoping that they answer is confirmation on who Chimere's former master was that kicked him out of the Jedi Order or who tried to kill him when he was trying to leave the Jedi Order. For now, I think the evidence points towards Vernestra Rowe just because of the pattern of the scar on his back is the same as the pattern of her lightsaber whip. The way the showrunner explained it too, she didn't intend to answer all the questions about Chimere, so the real tragedy of the season, I think, is that Chimere wound up being probably one of the more interesting characters, and they might have been better off focusing more on his character's journey and his backstory. Because if they do not do a season two, we're probably not going to get the rest of that Chimere backstory. But if there's any other Easter eggs or references that you spotted in the episode that I didn't talk about during the video, write them below in the comments. In my full episode eight video for the finale, we'll post it next week after they release it. The other big reminder is that we're supposed to get that Star Wars Skeleton Crew series at the end of this year around Christmas time, but we won't get a trailer for that for a little while, I think. There's a bunch of other big stuff going on right now. We're in the middle of Boys Season 4 episodes, House of the Dragon Season 2 episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get all those. Everybody click here for my House of the Dragon Season 2 Episode 5 video, and click here for my Boys Season 4 Episode 6 video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.